Okay, welcome back. And we are picking up with the man born blind and he's being examined by the Pharisees. And so we're in John chapter 9 and verse 17. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. By what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He's of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, He's of age, ask him. There were a number of secret followers, because if any man confessed Jesus as the Christ, he would immediately be ostracized from the community and from the temple worship. Even Joseph of Arimathea, who was a member of the council, could not openly confess Christ. Joseph, actually I'm quoting from verse 38 of that chapter. He was a secret follower because of the Jews. They were so against Christ. Going on to verse 24, then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. Did he do to thee? How open he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will ye this man put the Pharisees in their place? Verse 28. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. And actually Psalm 66 substantiates the point of the man who can now see. How does, uh, how uh, God does not hear sinners, God hears the obedient. In verse, in chapter 66, or Psalm 66, verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me, he hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Okay, let's go back to John 9, 32. And the blind man continues, since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. As we have previously pointed out, there is not one case in the Old Testament where a man born blind was healed. In verse 34, they answered him and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Well, that was the Jewish mentality of the day. Physical impediments were a curse because of sin. Thus they received not his witness. Now, in verse 35, 
Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Jesus did not reveal himself like this to everyone. But here was a man whose life had been changed by the power of the gospel, and his heart was ready to receive. It's very unusual that he revealed himself like this. Very few actually uh, had this revelation, at least in scripture. In verse 38, 938, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So here's a picture of true conversion. And I might insert that this is why we need to see the power of God restored, healing and miracles open up the people's heart to hear the gospel. We need to see a restoration, a renewing of the power of God in the church. So Jesus continues here in verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into the world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And here's a case in point. The blind could now see, the seeing remained blind. And verse 40. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. So, here is another awesome truth. Mankind is judged upon the light that he has or upon the light that he has rejected. It is better never to have known than to see and then reject. As Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, he said, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Peter also speaks of those who are willingly ignorant. Second Peter 3 8. They want to remain ignorant. They don't want to hear. They don't want to be responsible for the truth. So in summary of this chapter, let us consider the thought of liberty. Some people cannot take liberty. They do better spiritually when there's a bondage in their life. Israel was set free from bondage, but they used their newfound freedom of expression to badmouth God and leadership. They were set free from diseases, as the psalm says, that there was not one sickly one among them. Psalm 105 and verse 37. And yet they used their bodies for fornication. They were brought out with silver and gold, and they used their wealth for idolatry. They fashioned the golden calf. So Israel actually had to be put under the bondage of the law because they could not take liberty. May this not be our case. Amen. Okay, we're moving on now to chapter 10. And in chapter 10, Jesus reveals himself as the good shepherd. Now, about 600 years earlier, the prophet Ezekiel brought quite an indictment against the shepherds of Israel. This is in Ezekiel 34. And in that indictment, the Lord said, because my shepherds are not doing their job, 
I myself will come and minister to my sheep. So we're looking at Ezekiel 34 and verse 11. And it says, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. Now this, of course, was fulfilled as Jesus reveals himself as the Good Shepherd in this chapter. Ezekiel's prophecy also has some millennial overtones because in the millennium, the Good Shepherd will gather Israel again. And so Israel again is restored in the millennium. Also in this narrative, Jesus is again opposed by the unbelieving Jews. But as the Good Shepherd said, my sheep will hear my voice. So, John 10 and beginning in verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, going back to the ancient times, and even to this day, the sheepfolds only have one entrance. In fact, the entrance is very narrow so that the shepherd can count his sheep. They almost have to squeeze past the shepherd. The true shepherd does not have to sneak into the fold. He comes through the gate. Verse 3. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Now, in the fold, there was often a gatekeeper, a reporter. The reason for this was because there was often a number of flocks that would overnight in the same fold. A number of shepherds would bring their sheep into the same fold, so you have a lot of different sheep there in the same. It was opened, the shepherds would call for their sheep, and all of these various flocks would gravitate toward their shepherd. Very interesting scenario. And verse 4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know the, not the voice of strangers. So, going This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Now, once again, the Jews could never understand the spiritual implications. Actually, that was the reason Jesus spoke in parables. It was because he only wanted those who love the truth to hear him. Remember, his sheep hear his voice. In verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, Jesus fulfilled all the tabernacle pattern. There was only one door into the tabernacle, and the tabernacle was a shadow of heavenly truths. There's only one door into the kingdom. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. Going on to John 10, 8. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. There were others that came before Christ, which were thought to be the deliverer, the Messiah. Some actually gravitated toward them, 
But the greatest caution concerns the last days. There will be a fall. And those who represent Christ, but preach another gospel. Satan is called a thief and a robber. In verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Again, there's only one door into the kingdom, and that is through Christ. There is no other entrance. God will only accept us through the crucified one, through the crucified Christ. As ministers, we are the door to the flock over which the Lord has given us a charge. So we must guard our flock. We must watch who's coming in. And it is also our duty to lead our flock into the green pastures. Amen. Peter also encourages the Lord's shepherds to feed the flock over which has made them overseers. And that comes from 1 Peter 5, 2. In fact, that is the duty of the minister. That's the number one duty is to feed the sheep. Not the same old, same old every week, but we need to give them old truths and new truths and continually feed the flock and nourish them. We must also lead our flock into the paths of peace. Beside the still waters, God wants us to lead our flock into rest. Amen. Verse 10. The thief cometh, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. It is amazing when you consider some of the shepherds of today, the televangelists, pastors, they live in million dollar estates. Well, some of their followers have nothing. They promise their listeners that if they will give to their ministry, they will be oh so blessed. They take, but do not give. Like the shepherds mentioned in Ezekiel 34, and I'm quoting from Ezekiel 34 and verse two. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, uh, God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Not the shepherds feed the flocks. Ye eat the fat, ye clothe you with the wool, ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. So, in short, the shepherds were taking good care of themselves, but giving nothing in return. And many times we listen in to hear what these preachers are feeding the flock. It is junk food at the best. Many of them walk around and say nothing. And the unfortunate thing is that the flock does not know the difference. Ezekiel 34, 4, the diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken. So the worst part is that you have a flock that's diseased with sin, sin sick, and the minister is putting little bandages on their cancers by telling them that God loves them no matter what, they're proclaiming peace when there is no peace, telling them that there is no need for repentance. So coming back to the Good Shepherd, in verse 11, John 10, 11, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling 
and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he's a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. You see, the good shepherd faces the wolf. He defends the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. He hazards his life to salvage some. The hireling is working for a paycheck. Puts in his 30 hours and goes home. The true shepherd is willing to spend and to be spent as those mentioned in the Acts. In fact, let me 15, 20. Paul is talking about men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, again in John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Christianity is a relationship. Christ knows us. We know Christ. Verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So here's the good shepherd. Lays down his life for his sheep. Not only in the big picture, but even in the garden, when the soldiers. Jesus said, you have me, let these go. Jesus wanted to defend his disciples, even in that last hour. John 10, 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now, of course, Christ is now referring to the Gentile nations coming in, and the Jews and the Gentiles becoming one in Christ. In fact, what separated the Jew and Gentile was the law of ceremony, but the time would come again when they would be made one. And I'm quoting from Ephesians 2.14. And Paul said, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us. He's talking about Jew and Gentile. What separated them? It was a ceremonial law. And so Christ, of course, became the peace offering and, and that uh, ceremonial law was abolished. And Jew and Gentile could now become one in Christ. Okay, we're going on to verse 17, 10, 17. Therefore doth my father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. So here is a true sacrifice. It's being offered of free will. Christ willingly laid down as he said. I could call 12 legions of angels to the rescue if I desired. Matthew 26, 53. Christ also had the power to take his life up again, which of course he proved through his resurrection. In verse 19, there was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. This was a hard saying for the Jews, that Christ could lay his life down and take it up again. The Jews could not accept 
that Jesus was the Christ and that he was divine. And many of them said, he hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Jesus' ministry brought absolute division among the people. In fact, Jesus said that that he had come to bring a sword, a sword that divides peoples and households. In fact, I'm kind of jumping ahead here. Well, looking at another verse from Matthew 10, 34 and 35, and Jesus said this, not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I'm not to send peace, but a sword, not come to send peace, but a sword. Verse 35, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The word of God separates people. Even within the church, the word of God separates people. Some years ago, I was exposed to a prophet teacher, and the man was profound. He shared visions, revelations that were so unusual from anything that I had ever heard that I had to come to this conclusion. Either this man was 100% on, or he was 100% off. He was a phony. There was no in between. Furthermore, I could not refute anything he said from the scripture. So in the end, I accepted him as a true prophet, and he certainly was. Well, going on to John 10, 22, and it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now the feast of dedication goes back to the time of Judas Maccabeus, at 2nd century BC, 164 BC. After the temple had been cleansed from the Syrian king Antiochus, when the priests relit the golden candlesticks, they did not have enough consecrated oil to lamps. However, the lamp continued to burn for eight days, which was a miracle. So even to this day, the Jews celebrate this occasion and it's better known as the Feast of Lights or Hanukkah. Of course, it always takes place during December and the weather is very inclement. Okay, so Jesus walked in the temple and the porch that was supposedly rebuilt on the same spot as the original porch. The thought of Christ walking in his temple gives us a picture of revival. Revival is when Christ visits his church. In verse 24, then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Jesus gave the Father, God the Father, credit for all the miracles that he did. By rejecting the miracles that Jesus did, they were rejecting the Father. Jesus said in another place, If a man is doing miracles in my name, he cannot lightly speak evil of me. That comes from Mark 9.39. Okay, going on to verse 26, 10, 26. But ye believed not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than I, greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Okay, now there's several things here. 
Although Jesus continually tells his audience that he and the Father are one, Jesus distinguishes the Father as being greater than he. They're absolutely one in the Spirit. The Godhead moves in absolute unity. Christ was the full expression of his Father. Now, secondly, some of these verses have been greatly abused or distorted concerning eternal security. Absolutely true, no man is able to pluck us out of the hand of God. God is able to keep us from falling. And while no alien force is able to remove us from the kingdom, we can disqualify ourselves. Unrepentant sin can disqualify us. And Paul is very clear on that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul is addressing the church. And so just looking at uh, 1 Corinthians 6 for a moment, because he, Paul is saying, don't be deceived on this. And in verse chapter 6 and verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And he's speaking to Christians. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor effeminate, as are perverts, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Paul exhorts the Corinthians not to be deceived on this. And this is also substantiated in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and verse 8 and also in Revelation 22, 14 through 15. If any man says that he loves God and does not keep his commandments, he's a liar. The blood of Christ only covers us as we continue to walk in the light. And you could put down 1 John 1, 7. So salvation is something we want to make our that that our calling and election sure we play a part in our election and that is by obedience also in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 it says this and being made perfect this is Christ he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him to all them that obey now, in these last days, there will be much deception, and there will be those who depart from the faith. Those who do not find grace to overcome are removed from the book of life. And I'm quoting again from 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 1. And Paul says this, now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So no man can take us out, but we can step out ourselves. Some shall depart from the faith. They're listening to another spirit. And for another verse, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So there's a certain overcoming that has to take place in our life. And there is not a warning about being blotted out of the book if it were impossible. And we could do a sermon on that one, but... We have to, in order to fit this whole book in, we have to kind of keep going here. So let's go back to chapter 10 and verse 30. And Jesus says, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, 
Many works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Now, I wonder if the Jews were really expecting their Messiah to be God. It is a little hard to comprehend that God would be born, but it is written in the prophets that it would be so. And so, just backing up into Isaiah in chapter 9 and verse 6, the scripture clearly tells us that this child that was to be born would be God. And uh, in chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So clearly, this one who is born was part of the Godhead. And also, it's written in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 that the one that would be born in Bethlehem would be from eternity. He was from the beginning of time with the Father. Okay, well, let's go on to John's Gospel again, chapter 10 and verse 34. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, you're gods? If he called them gods, this is little g, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, Jesus is quoting from Psalm 82, and again, note that the word gods is small g, and it's because man is destined to live forever. And we want to make sure we spend forever with our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. In verse 36, Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. You see what Jesus is saying? Believe for the work's sake. I do these works in the name of the Father. Verse 39, therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. And he went again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And many believed on him there. So in spite of the resiliency of the Jews, there were still many that believed on him. Essentially, those who received John the Baptist's ministry received Christ. And that completes John chapter 10. Okay, we're picking up in chapter 11. And most of the narrative in this chapter concerns the resurrection of Lazarus, and of course, Jesus reveals himself here as the resurrection and the life. Chapter 11 also brings us to the beginning of the final Passover. So we're in chapter 11, and beginning in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord 
with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Actually, there were two occasions where Jesus' feet were anointed by a woman who wiped his feet with the hairs of their head. One of them is recorded in Luke 7, which would have been toward the end of Jesus' first year of ministry. The second occasion is in John chapter 12, which is the next chapter. So, the woman being alluded to is not the same as Luke 7, but rather the Mary mentioned in chapter 12. So, these two events where Jesus' feet were anointed were at least two or two and a half years apart. So the Mary that is mentioned here in verse 2 is the sister of Martha and Lazarus. In verse 3, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now, the home of Lazarus and his sisters was a home that Jesus loved to visit. And as the narrative points out, Jesus cared much for this man, Luke 1038. In John 11, 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus knew exactly how things were going to finish out here. But in order for the greater miracle to be done, Jesus is not going to immediately respond. Verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. Naturally speaking, both the Jews and the Romans allotted 12 hours to the day, daylight hours. However, Jesus is revealing a spiritual truth. We only have an allotted time here on earth to finish our assignment, whatever it is. Jesus' time was winding down. He's coming to the final Passover, which is his final assignment as a mortal. In verse 10, But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Now verse 10 is alluding to those who have never been illumined by the light of life. Salvation illumines our soul. The unsaved have no light in them, and they will surely stumble. God's word is a light unto our path. The unbelievers do not know this light. Let's go on to verse 11. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now oftentimes the word sleep is used for a metaphor of death. The disciples misunderstood what Jesus was saying. Thus Jesus plainly said, he's dead and he was going to awaken him. Going on to verse 15. 
And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now, there are a few ways that you could view verse 16. There is often great lamentation when a person died. Did Thomas mean, let us go and lament and feel the grief? Or did he mean, let us also take and risk our lives by going into Judea? Remember, the Jews were out to take the life of Jesus. Well, either which way, verse 17, uh, then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now, Pastor Bailey points out that according to Jewish superstition, the spirit could linger for three days after death. By Jesus coming on the fourth day, the Jews could not attribute this to any natural phenomenon. In verse 18, now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs. Bethany means the house of unripe figs. All of these names are significant in scripture. In a sense, Lazarus was going to be resurrected before the time. We could almost look at Lazarus as a type of the man-child. The man-child in the book of Revelation is resurrected three and a half years before the rapture of the church. In verse 19, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. A very interesting little study here because there was a very different spiritual temperament between the two sisters. Martha immediately went out to meet him. Mary waited to be called. And I believe these both represent types of groups that will be at the marriage supper. However, it seems that Mary represents the more spiritual group. And if you'd like a cross-reference here, you could put the Song of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 12, and also in the Song of Solomon, chapter 6 and verse 8 through 9. Verse 21, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. So you have to deduce here that Martha was certainly a woman of faith. I know that whatsoever you ask of God, he will give it. Verse 23. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus now reveals himself as the resurrection and the life. Here's another one of the I am's in John. Remember, there are seven I am's. And of course, Jesus was the I am going back to the revelation of Christ to Moses. He was the I am that I am. In verse 26, Jesus said, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Lord, yea, Lord, 
I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now, Martha actually is one of the few people recorded in Scripture outside the disciples that recognizes Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. So Mary was a, Martha was a, a woman of faith. She was impetuous. She was of a different temperament, but certainly a woman of faith. Verse 28, And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now, Mary represents the bride in many ways. She's waiting to be called. She's one that is in private communion with Christ. And she immediately responds to his call. In verse 30, Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her, in the house and comforted her. When they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out and followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her. He groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And this reminds us of what the prophet said in Isaiah 63, 9, that where it says, in all of their affliction, he was afflicted. One of the reasons that God became man was that he might feel the weakness and the temptation and the sorrow of humanity. As the Apostle says in the book of Hebrews, that we have a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity or weakness. He can be touched with our need because as a man, he experienced the same, all of the temptation, yet, without sin, as pointed out in Hebrews 4.15. It's wonderful to have a high priest that understands where we're coming from because he became a man so that he could experience what it is to be mortal. In verse 34, Jesus said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. So here is the Son of Man side of Christ. He's weeping. In verse 36, Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus was sighing with great empathy. And he said in verse 39, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto him, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Christ gave the Father thanks in advance and especially for the sake of those standing around. 
I mean, Jesus continually attributed every miracle to Father God. In verse 42, And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that thou may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now, as has often been pointed out, had not Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, all of the dead in the cemetery would have resurrected. So Jesus was very careful to identify him by name. John eleven forty four, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Let us also see some of the spiritual implications here. Because oftentimes when people are raised from the dead spiritually, that is, they're born again, they still have bondages. And there is a need to have these bondages broken. They need to be loosed. So salvation is just the beginning of an experience. Okay, let's go on to verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Even though many had seen unbelievable miracles take place, they still believed not on him. And if you'd like a reference on that, John... 1337. But going on here to verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Now, the Pharisees had no doubt about the genuineness of the miracles. And even the fact that Christ did these miracles in the name of God but they still chose to reject him. They were true hypocrites. They loved their positions more than they loved the truth. So here, here are the Pharisees in verse 48. And they're saying, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And they didn't care whether he was true or not, they only cared about their positions. Now here is something very interesting because here is the high priest who now begins to prophesy. And in verse 49, it says, And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Actually, this is an amazing prophecy. Now, Caiaphas, the high priest, prophesied that one should die for the nation and gather together all the children of God. Now, was Caiaphas a godly man? Did this man have any regard for Christ? No, he did not. But this brings us to a very important truth. Because God often honors the office or the position, even though the person that's filling the post here is not upright. 
He might not honor the man, but he honors the office. So in reality, it is God who puts men into position, the good and the bad. They're there to fulfill God's will, be it good or evil. God puts leaders into position that generally reflect the spiritual condition of the nation. And you could note Romans 13, 1 and 2 on that. I'm reminded of a, of a story I heard years ago about an evangelist who is coming down to a tent meeting and as he's coming to the tent, the wind is blowing and it's contorting the tent and he sees the face of God in this tent and the face of God is angry. So when he gets into the tent, he's, uh, he's a little bit shook because he just witnessed the face of God being angry and this man was not living as he should have by any means. But anyway, his time comes to preach, he gets up, he preaches, people get healed, people get saved, and uh, after the service he's sitting in the chair and he's saying to himself, well, God couldn't be too mad at me. You know, after he sees the results of the service, and then God speaks again and says to him, I am not honoring you, I am honoring my word, and I'm honoring my position. So. The point is that God oftentimes gives gifts even to the rebellious that he might dwell with them. And sometimes the only thing that holds people in the church are the gifts that are operating. Let's look at a verse in Psalm 68, 18. And here's the ascension of Christ. It says, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. So just remember this, that gifts do not necessarily qualify the person, but as Jesus said, by their fruits ye shall know them. So there can be people out there that have genuine gifts and still not walking uprightly, but it is the fruit that qualifies the person. Let's go on to verse 53. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. And perhaps the Jews took the prophecy of Caiaphas that one should die for the nation as a confirmation to kill Christ. Who knows? Verse 54. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. Now, once again, you have the thought of timing. Jesus walked very carefully, very circumspectly, because Jesus knew when it was his time. In verse 55, And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. So the Jews had to go through a ritual a purification before they could observe the Passover. And you see a good example of this in 2 Chronicles 30, verse 1 through 4. But it was during this time of purification that the Jews were questioning whether Jesus would come up to the feast. I mean, after all, his life was in jeopardy. In verse 56, Then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves, as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will come not, that he will not come to the feast? 
Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. Okay, we're in chapter 12 of John's Gospel, and chapter 12 begins six days before the Passover. Now, this was the Passover that Christ would historically fulfill, that he would, was going to fulfill this Passover. Christ would become the lamb for sinners slain. And Christ had to die, really had to die on a Wednesday to fulfill Matthew 12, 40, because he had to be in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights. Couldn't possibly do that on a Friday. Well, the opening scene in this chapter must have taken place on a Thursday. So it begins with a banquet that was being held in Jesus' honor. And according to Matthew, this banquet was taking place in the house of Simon the leper. And you could put Matthew 26, 6 down. So it's here that Mary anoints Jesus or his burial. The triumphal entry is also mentioned in this chapter, and it is in this chapter that Jesus reveals the way in which he is going to die. He said, if I be lifted up, that is on the cross, then I will draw all men to me. You know, the cross is the connecting place for all of mankind. The horizontal bar speaks of the horizontal bar speaks of mankind, and the vertical bar is where we connect with Christ. We can only connect with Christ through the cross. But we're in chapter twelve and verse one, and uh, it says. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now, as mentioned in the preface, preface this supper took place at the house of Simon the leper, In verse 3, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. The three individuals mentioned in this narrative could almost represent three groups. Even at the marriage supper, there are various groups represented. And for example, in Luke 22, 27, it says, for whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as one that serveth. Now, Lazarus, could serve as a type of the man-child. He's resurrected before the time. And so he would fit into a certain group. And we're just spiritualizing on this. Mary appears to be the special one, the bride. Now, one of the marriage customs of the times was for the bride to pour out her special ointment that she had saved for her wedding day. It was very costly. And you could compare this with the Song of Solomon. In this scenario, or in this poem, it is the bride that breaks the box of ointment. And so, just drawing from the Song of Songs here, chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, While the king sitteth at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. We should also note from John 12, 3, that the room was filled with the odor of the ointment. 
Now, a spike nard in the word of God speaks of peace. Mary poured this ointment upon Jesus' head and feet. And you find that in Matthew 26, 7. But Jesus had great peace and composure as he was about to pay, partake of a very cruel ordeal. Martha is also a woman of faith, servant of Christ, but does not share the intimate communion of Mary. But let's continue here in verse 4 and 5. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, 300 pence is essentially a year's wage. And also in the law of hermeneutics, the number 300 represents walking with God. In verse six, concerning Judas, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Now, if you compare this with the other Gospels, Judas puts this word in the mouth of the other disciples as well. Judas was very subtle. He was a discord sower. And just drawing from Matthew 26 and verse 8, it says, But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? But you see, John puts it, he brings it down to where that was coming from. It was Judas who put this in the mouth of the other disciples. Now, was this a waste to pour a box of ointment upon the co-creator of the universe, especially on the eve of his execution? Was this a waste? Going on into verse 7, Then said Jesus, Let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Now, this is not to disannul our responsibility to the poor. But here is the co-creator. He is about to be offered up for all of you men. Humanity, all of mankind. John 12, 9. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Now, there is the height of hypocrisy. Can you imagine these religious leaders plotting to put a man to death simply because he had been raised from the dead? Lazarus was a testimony that they wanted to get rid of. Okay, verse 11, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. The next day is a, a little phrase that causes some difference of opinion. There are different views on what day the triumphal entry actually took place. The general opinion is that it took place on Sunday, Palm Sunday. We celebrate every year at Palm Sunday. But one thing is sure, some of Jesus' greatest teachings and miracles took place between the triumphal entry and his crucifixion. In fact, during that little uh, epoch of time, 
there was the second cleansing of the temple. And also many were healed in the temple after it was cleansed, Matthew 21, 14. There was a cursing of the fig tree, which was significant. Jesus was teaching in the temple, Luke 19, 47 through 48. And all were very attentive. Many of his parables were given during that last few days. And in fact, some of those parables indicted the religious leaders. The Olivet Discourse was given in these last few days. The teachings in the upper room in the last night. So John 12 through 21 all take place from the triumphal entry unto his resurrection. Okay, going on to verse 14. And Jesus when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Sion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting, sitting on an ass's colt. And this is a quote from Zechariah 9.9. 9. Also, the triumphal entry is alluded to in Genesis 49, verses 10 through 11. And also in Psalm 24, verses 7 through 9. Going on to verse 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. Israel did not recognize their king. He was meek and lowly, riding upon an ass's colt. They will, however, recognize him the next time because the next time he comes on a white horse. John twelve seventeen. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. Now, the miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus continued to draw a large audience. In verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. The whole, the whole world has gone after him. So to them, and it was so, Christ was an unstoppable force until the time that he laid his life down. And of course, he's still an unstoppable force. But going on to verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Now, these Greeks must have been Greek proselytes. They had proselyted and accepted the Jewish faith, and there's a, a process that they go through. Verse 21, The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, what Christ was saying was, through his death, all men would come to him. Not just the Greeks, but all men. And Jesus is going to employ one of the facts of nature. We plant one solitary seed, but that one seed can ultimately produce thousands of apples or grapes or figs. 
So the seed is planted in the ground, it rots, it germinates, and from that decayed seed springs new life. And so Jesus is going to make a personal application. Verse 25, he that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. You see, there has to be a certain death to self in order to reflect the life of Christ. As long as we love self, as long as we are more concerned about ourself, Christ cannot be seen. We have to diminish. Remember what John the Baptist said? I must decrease that he might increase. Verse 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So true service means self-denial. As Jesus later said, not my will, but thine be done. Sometimes we must sacrifice our agenda. Love to do that. Or our ambitions in order to get the work of, to do the work of God. Verse 27. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Well, nobody in their right mind is looking forward to being tortured. But Christ knew that this was the price that had to be paid, and Christ did not shrink from his mission. That's what he came for. Okay, well, I'm afraid we're going to have to cut off here because the end of the class, so I see our time is up. But we shall pick up here in the third day, and uh, hopefully you are all present. God bless you. Have a good evening.